All right, welcome back, everyone. We're back with just reading the SCP wiki because I'm bored. Very bored. So, SCP-011, object class safe. Special containment procedures, SCP-011 and the surrounding area or the area surrounding it, are to be cleaned once every day. For safety purposes, cleaning should start at least 30 minutes after sundown. Cleaning should always be performed by at least two personnel, who are also advised to note anything unusual about the item or the debris is cleared up. In a situation where the item cannot be cleared for more than two days, local residents must be contacted and instructed not to approach the item. Containment procedures nullified in 2004. Description. SCP-011 is a Civil War memorial statue located in Woodstock, Vermont. The statue is the image of a young male soldier holding a musket at his side, and is carved out of granite quarried within the area. Occasionally, SCP-011 has been observed lifting its musket to the sky to fire at birds which attempt to land or defecate on it. Reports detail that its movement produced soft grinding noises, but do not cause any structural failure. Oddly, the gunfire is very similar to that of a standard firearm, despite observations that the statue or that the item only loads granite bullets and granite powder into the musket, which is also unharmed by the firing. In spite of its efforts, some fecal matter does manage to strike SCP-011 and it has reportedly become distressed when it has had a large amount of feces on it. On some rare occasions, even firing at humans. Addendum. Those assigned to SCP-011 are to see Document 011-1 for instructions. Document 011-1, maintenance brief. Documentation archived 2004. Accessible to personnel with Security 11 that security clearance to 11 or higher. Additionally, additional information. SCP-011 seems seeming sentience has increased since the first report of activity in 1995. As of 2004, the item's containment procedures have been dropped, but it remains under constant observation. Recorded below are landmark events in its activity. Timeline. 3 12 1995. Woodstock resident reports the statue moving. First sign of activity. 9 30 1995. Statue shoots musket for the first time. 10 9 1995. Statue begins shooting birds in the sky. 1 25 1996. Registration as SCP 011 containment procedures begin. 4 14 1997. SCP-011 observed moving casually and looking around. 5-3-2000. After caretaker blank, blank, jokingly shouts, good shot at SCP-011, the item re replies, thank you. In a reportedly very human voice. First speech from statue. 10-22-2001. SCP-011 has conversation with caretaker blank, blank. 2001. Shooting of birds stops. 2-6-2002. At the imploring of blank blank, SCP-011 steps down from its pedestal. 11-10-2004. Containment procedures dropped. Custody of SCP-011 transferred to blank blank. 5-17-2005. Blank blank reports that SCP-011 is romantically attracted to her. 8-29-2006. Most recent psych test reports IQ of 133. That's the end of that. SCP-012, Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. 012 is to be kept in a darkened room at all times. If the object is exposed to light or seen by personnel using a light frequency other than infrared, remove personnel for mental health screening and immediate physical. Object is to be encased in an iron shielded box suspended from the ceiling with a minimum clearance of 2.5 meters or 8 feet from the floor, walls, and any openings. Description 
was retrieved by archaeologist K.M. Sandoval during the excavation of a northern Italian tomb destroyed in a recent storm. The object, a piece of handwritten music score entitled On Mount Galothia, part of a larger set of sheet music, appears to be incomplete. The red slash black ink, first thought to be some form of berry or natural dye ink, was later found to be human blood from multiple subjects. The first personnel to locate the sheet, Site 19 Special Salvage, had two team members descend into insanity, attempting to use their own blood to finish the composition, ultimately resulting in massive blood loss and internal trauma. Following initial investigations, multiple test subjects were allowed to access the score. In every case, the subjects mutilated themselves in order to use their own blood to finish the piece, resulting in subsequent symptoms of psychosis and massive trauma. Those subjects who managed to finish a section of the piece immediately committed suicide, declaring the piece to be impossible to complete. Attempts to perform the music have resulted in a disagreeable cacophony, with each instrumental part having no correlation or harmony with the other instruments. End. SCP-013 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 013 are to be kept in a secure storage vault on Site-66. Exposed subjects are to be monitored for differences between their symptoms. Exposed subjects are to be interviewed daily, and any changes in perception are to be logged. Description. 013 is the collective designation of the 242 cigarettes that display similar anomalies. The most common external detail between instances on or between instances is the presence of the words blue lady. And written on each cigarette in blue. Subjects who consume the contents of SCP-013 through inhalation will begin to perceive themselves as a specif specific unidentified woman. Subjects have described the woman to be ages, aged between 25 and 35 years old, standing approximately 1.5 or 1.6 sorry meters tall with an estimated weight between 50 and 55 kilograms additionally reoccurring details include cropped dark hair blue eyes and bright blue lipstick immediately after consuming an instance of SCP-013 subjects will gradually begin to perceive reflections of themselves as having the features of the woman and will gradually perceive their bodies changing to reflect her appearance over the course of the following weeks. All changes are entirely mental. The subject's body does not change outwardly, only their perception of themselves. These alterations are permanent and cannot be reversed. SCP-013 was discovered after the suicide of Ian Miles, packed in a large cardboard crate in his apartment. A cursory search of the apartment uncovered several hundred sketches of a figure strongly resembling ones perceived while under 013's effect. Miles' body has been found sitting at a desk, dead of massive overdose, and draped over a handwritten note transcribed below. During the investigation of Miles' apartment, one civilian investigator became affected by 013's effect. An embedded agent soon contacted the nearest site, the subject, the artifact, and related evidence were extracted and contained. Currently, 217 instances of SCP-013 cigarettes are contained at Biosite 66. 25 013 cigarettes are contained at Research Sector 09, pending future research into similar anomalous effects. Addendum. Below is the note, which was acquired along with SCP-013. I see her everywhere, that sad blue lady. I feel like I used to know her. Used... Or... I feel like I used to should... And used to should is crossed out. Know her. But I can't remember. I love her, but I don't know why. 
She's so beautiful and sweet and clear. I don't know anymore. Favorite flavor. Where did you go? I miss you. It's to another SCP, so we'll maybe get to that one day. Alright. SCP. SCP-014, object class safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-014 is to be kept in sight, blank, blank, in a chair with arms, preferably facing a window. Music should be supplied on a regular basis, preferably constantly. This music should not include pieces originating after 1937. A security camera should be present in SCP-14's room. Description. 014 is a Caucasian male, appearing to be approximately 30 years in, of age, with black hair, brown eyes, and a somewhat round face. Records indicate his name to be Robert Chetford, confined in 1915 to the Norwich Asylum in Connecticut for delusional insanity, claiming that he had been cursed to live forever, and was slowly turning into concrete in consequence. The asylum closed in 1937, and the patients were transferred to various other facilities. Uh, SCP-014 came to the Foundation's attention in 19 blank from rumors of a patient who seemed to be entirely mobile and showed no signs of aging. Further investigation determined the acquisition was warranted. SCP-014 is to old outwards appearances a normal man but does not appear to age, and shows no sign of possessing metabolism. He does not eat, drink, perspire, or any other way demonstrate life functions. He breathes only to speak, and apart from his eyes and vocal apparatus, is to all appearances utterly immobile. He was never shown, or he has never shown any evidence of pressure ulcers, despite his position not having varied for several decades. Neither do his muscles appear atrophied. He can converse normally, but shows little knowledge or interest in events since his confinement. Addendum. Note. Frankly, were I to interview this man without knowing his history, I'd think he was a perfectly sane and well-adjusted individual who appears to be a quadriplegic. As it is, I have to conclude that he's the ultimate proof that the idea of the idea that the mind rules the body. He thinks he's concrete and will live forever, and so he's as close to both as he can be. Somehow. Dr. Blank. End of SCP. SCP-015. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-015 is impossible to move and is contained on site. A gap of at least 2 meters, 6 feet, needs to be maintained around the entire structure containing SCP-015 at all times, and no structure of any kind are to make contact with SCP-015's current containment structure. Exploration is permissible, but only in teams of three with full safety lines and GPS tracking. Any protrusions from SCP-015 must be kept and sealed immediately, with the new site recorded and logged. No aggressive action is to be made within SCP-015, no hand or power tools are allowed anywhere inside SCP-015. No repairs or maintenance are to be made anywhere on SCP-015. Description. 015 is a mass of pipes, vents, boilers, and other various plumbing apparatus currently filling a warehouse in blank. The pipes appear to grow when not under observation, attempting to connect to nearby structures via sewer systems and underground plumbing. SCP-015 contains, at current estimate, over 190 kilometers, 120 miles, of pipes, ranging in diameter from 2.5 cent centimeters to over 1 meter. Some pipes appear new, while others are rusted and leaking. Pipes are reported to be made of bone, wood, steel, pressed ash, human flesh, glass, and granite. No pipes composed of lead, PVC plastic, copper, or other traditional materials for the production of pipes have been found. SCP-015 reacts to tools and aggression. Any personnel acting violently 
carrying tools, or attempting to damage or repair SCP-015 in any way will trigger a reaction. Any pipes near the subject will burst, spraying on the subject with several, for several seconds before the flow suddenly stops. Pipes have been reported containing oil, mercury, rats, a species of insect not yet identified, ground glass, seawater, entrails, and molten iron. Pipes will continue to burst around the subject until death or retreat. SCP-015 was cut back to its current structure after attaching to 11 structure, other structures in the area. Currently, 11 personnel have been killed and 20 or more are still missing. Reports have been made of banging and screaming coming from within SCP-015. Checking on the 015 reacts to Tools and Aggression link, we get a note called Plumbing, which is about three times longer than the article itself. All right. <laughs> plumbing. This was stupid. It was a stupid idea, thought up by stupid people in stupid, safe offices. Agent 2 looked around slowly, letting his flashlight play over the walls. One of the only items the agents were allowed to carry inside SCP-015. Agent 6 and Lon were watching just behind him, doing the same. The idle chatter and joking had died off about 30 seconds ago each agent slowly realizing that this was no simple little note. Go in, find the observation unit, pull the data, recover the unit. Cake. They'd laughed. Lon asked if she would find a Mario hat to wear. Or if she should find a Mario hat. They being plumbers now and all. Now, however, seeing the dim, cramped tunnel yawning before them, the only joke was them being there at all. Two step forward, slowly, fixing his flashlight on the ground. It was a hard mat of pipes, more or less level with the floor. A few small tubes stuck up here and there, snaking around like tree roots, or suddenly turning up in the middle of the floor like a pillar. The walls, the ceiling, every inch of the original structure was coated in pipes. Some researcher who led them up to the main door, said there wasn't anything left of the old warehouse except for the outer shell. He pushed away that whole line of thought, pointedly following the pre-mapped course they had to memorize. Stepping around a pillar of tightly woven hair, the glossy surface steaming gently. Six plugged long, taking the rear and keeping a close eye on two at long. Skittish kids. Lon was jumping at every sound, and Two looked like he was ready to drop and run if he saw so much as a mouse. Kids. He sniffed at the dark, playing his life forward, smelling heat, sewage, and god knows what else. They needed a good military hand to lead them, but damned if Six was gonna mollycoddle grown adults who were going to jump at shadows. They were going to get this goddamn job done and get the hell back out. Fuck that bullshit SCP slip. They were just security blankets for eggheads and flakes. Semi sentient, my ass. They just didn't want people denting their pet horrors. He wanted out of this dripping nightmare. He was going to get this mission done with or without them. Long tiptoed over thick. Thorny mat of pipe, mass of pipes, the surface like braided thistles, trying not to wicker. She got close to two, keeping the light at her feet so she wouldn't step on anything nasty. She hadn't wanted to keep the. She hadn't wanted to seem like the weak girl, but she had a terrible fear of tight spaces. And this place was like walking around in someone's slowly closing arteries. Lon shook his head. Breaking off that whole train of thought. She was a tech. Six and two were the safety. All she had to do was stick, with, stick by them. Pull the data. Pull the data cards out of the MRV and leave. She tried hard not to look back at the sealed doors 
in the distance behind us. Only a couple turns to the MRV. A little work, and out. In and out, simple as pie. She ignored a softly throbbing tape of leathery flesh near her arm with a focus that was almost physical. They found the MRV after what felt like hours of walking. It was hard to keep your bearings. The rampant growth of the pipes had cramped some areas down to crawlways and snarled others in the into random. Claustrophobic. Six had nearly gotten struck once, and had looked like he was about to murder Lon when she made a comment related to Winnie the Pooh. Lon was talking again, but... Lon was talking again, at least, but it was brittle. Whistle. Lon was talking again, but at least... Words, I can do this. Lon was talking again, at least, but it was brittle. Oh, okay. Lon was talking again, at least, at least, but it was brittle whistle in front of the graveyard chatter. Two kept trying to follow the directions, but even with them being less than a week old, they were little more than a guy. When they found, when they finally found the MRV, it had been a momentary relief. At least they were at the halfway. Point. Then they had looked at it in the lake. It had been speared, for lack of a better term, pinned against a pipe of some kind of dense fabric, a smooth black pipe that had docked itself to the camera lens of the observation vehicle. It wasn't smashed or damaged. It just connected, and if it was as if it was made for it. It had lifted the little treaded robot nearly half a foot off the ground, nearly a foot off the ground, and it looked like other smaller pipes had started connecting to other spaces on the vehicle. It just sat there, wheels slowly spinning as the battery died, like a bug in the nest of pins. Some foul-smelling fluid was dripping softly from the camera housing. Well, whose voice echoed in the dark. Moment of pointless speech. They all stood for a few moments, then Len started to, carefully, look over the MRV. Six was looking around with an increasing restlessness, starting to mutter quietly. Lon was reaching for the data cards before stopping, looking over at two. Um, two? Since it's grown into the MRV, do you think it counts? What do you mean counts? Two kept the light on her and the machine, a hiss of steam behind it making him flinch. I mean, as damaging 015. If I take out the data cards, do you think it will react? Two looked around slowly, shifting his lighting along the floor or light along the floor, a pipe as wide as a car, seemingly made out of compact lint. This suddenly seems like a bad- Oh, shut the fuck up. Both agents turned to stare at Six. He stepped up to the MRV, flexing his hands and reaching into his coat with one hand. The others pushed Lon away so none too softly. Move it. Reaction, for God's sake. They just say that shit- to fuck with people and keep their toys safe. It's a bunch of weird pipes, beginning and end. There. Maybe it's growing or whatever, but the damn thing sure as shit ain't going to take offense to people. I'm grabbing this goddamn thing and we're getting out of here. As he spoke, he stepped forward, flipping open the, that, flipping open the data port cover. More of the clear, scummy liquid had pooled inside. The other two agents froze, staring in shock a moment, and the building seemed to do so as well. The whispered sounds of venting steam, sliding materials, and soft pinging had all stopped. Heartbeat in Lon's ears sounded like a go, like gunshots. 
Two started forward reaching for six. Jesus, six, what the fuck are... Six ignored him, slipping out the thin data cards. They felt like old, nasty water all over them. Bad. But they were built to resist it. He slipped them out and put the bundle in his pocket. He around the edge of the camera lens, shifting the MRV a bit, trying to see if he could work free as Two and Lon backed away, slowly. The silence around them seemed to rush inwards. Six gave up, turning away from the helplessly trapped MRV and shining his light at the two white-faced agents. Fucking kids. I don't know how you guys survive. The pipe under him opened with the soft sound of tearing felt. Tu and Lon didn't have time to react before he slid into the widening gap up to his armpits and started screaming horribly. Six's flashlight went tumbling away as the two agents, galvanized by the big man's wretched screaming, ran to help him. A blast of heat and light poured up from under the man as the two agents grabbed his arms and looked down. He was submerged in a mass of thickly flowing molten glass. His clothes had already started to smolder and burn, the stench of seared flesh almost more overpowering than the reverberating screams. They pulled and dragged up half a man with a ruined, seared mass of flesh and cloth where his lower body should have been. They, pain they panted, trying to drag him. Lon started screaming along with Six, Two's eyes wide and fixed on something far away from there. There was a horrible sm swell of sound rushing all around them, pinging, hissing, cr clicking, cracking, and s a pipe to their side bulging alarmingly, causing them to nearly fall. They regained their footing just as a wooden pipe above them burst open in a spray of splinters of and clear stinging dust. Two and Lon spun away, gagging and choking, two spitting out a sudden mass of blood. Glass. It was powdered glass. It poured over Six, muffling his screams, shifting as he struggled for a few moments, then stopped, the glass quickly covering his body and spreading. Lon blinked, eyes red and puffy, looking over at Two. He nodded and they bolted down the hole, trying to ignore the rising cacophony of sound sounding like an approaching subway train. A mass of oily, reeking chemicals boiled up behind them, a jetting surge of rose thorns nearly cutting off their forward progress forcing them to crawl along a bone pipe that was shuddering like an old man in the cold. They ran, keeping just ahead of whatever it was, hearing splintering sounds and shivering cracks all around them. They finally came to a snarled crawlway, barely a few feet wide. That was the only way forward. Two dived in, doing a low crawl, trying to will himself forward like a snake. Knowing the passage was only about 15 feet long and easy, wouldn't take any time, Long hesitated, that tiny black gap looking like a mouth, before a sudden burst of steam behind her sent her shrieking forward, sobbing as she started to crawl after Two. Two ignored the growing vibrations all around him, the creaking painting near his head, and slid free of the opening. He turned and saw nothing, no lawn, no sudden bursting, just an empty hole. He looked around, hands twitching, thinking, then slid back inside, trying to find Lon and physically drag her out. He could hear her muffled probably behind the next turn, and his flashlight revealed a solid wall of three thick, flaking white pipes. This was it. He was sure of it. The tunnel was right here, and then he heard the pitiful scream behind them. Lon begging, pleading, screaming for him. Two started, eyes wide, then slammed his flashlight against the pipe. It burst, sending a reeking corrosive slime over his hand, making him reel back down the crawlway, screaming as it ate his flesh. He stood outside the opening, holding a steaming hand away from him, trying to look at, not look at the exposed bone. Oh, oh Jesus, Lon, Lon, I'm sorry, I'll get help. I'll get someone. Sit tight, I swear. He bolted down the hole, his flashlight seeming to dim in time to the rising sound. Lon panted, screaming for two, hearing the hard bang at the other side of the pipes in a sudden shrieking retreat. She sobbed, her body shaking, and slowly started to work her way backwards, crawling on her belly, crying as she muttered some half-remembered prayer when her feet pushed against a solid wall of pipe. She couldn't even muster a fresh scream. She was trapped, the space not much bigger than a coffin, helpless. She sobbed, face on the ground of warm, fuzzy pipes, 
and notice the silence. Aside from her cries, there was nothing. No pinging, no cracks or explosion, nothing. She raised her head in the barely illuminated dark, looking around. She was alive. It was calming down. They'd come for her. She would get help. She was getting out of here. She fought back her growing claustrophobia. Looking along the walls, she noticed a small gap in the ceiling and started shifting to get a better look. Twisting back and finally... Only the open end of a pipe. Long, sagging back, closing her eyes, tears leaking down her face. The first sticky drips she simply assumed were the same tears. One fell in her mouth, and it was sweet. She opened her eyes and saw a thick, quivering mass of amber goose splattering from the mouth of the pipe, coating her in the floor as it surged out. She coughed, shifting backwards. It was honey. Honey or something like it. At least it wasn't molten lead or acid. Then she saw the level was rising. It wasn't draining. The pipes were packed too close. She looked around her tiny chamber, with horror rising much faster than the honey oozing up her sides. Long beat on the walls, the floor, the ceiling, trying to block the pipe with her hands, heedless of provoking the thing more. As honey slowly... or as the honey rose and rose... As cloying sweet as her school-age lover. Her last gasping breath was sweet and stale with honey and screams. Two ran, totally lost now. His flashlight dimming by the moment. The sound of cracking, bursting pipes starting to trail off. Maybe it was done, finally. Zero fifteen was protective, but it didn't seem vengeful. People had gotten hurt before they'd gotten out fine. It happened. They'd find a way to get Lon out, too. She might, might be out already. Just found another way to get around the blockage. That was probably it. She was out of the stupid place. Six was a shame, but why had that lunatic opened the case? What the hell had possessed him? He was still amusing on this when he tripped over an unseen pipe in the dark around his feet. He pitched forward, yelping, half surprised, half terrified bark as he went spiral. He should have went sprawling, instead he fell past the floor, into a yawning open pit of pipe, the slick oozing sides plunging down the dark plunging down at a sharp angle. He screamed, trying to grab onto something to stop, slow himself. The walls were oozing him thick. Downward slide gaining speed, his flashlight showing a seemingly endless tunnel stretching off below him. He slid and slid, a scum of stinking smooth ooze sticking to his clothes and skin. The tube twisted, banging him against the wall as he followed it, his flashlight jittering and starting to flicker. An X slammed down like a fist, the tube grabbed the light, trying to keep it still, pleading with it, staring at the lamp bulb as it sh dimmed more and more. It surged a moment, then flickered out, the darkness pressing to his eyes like a cloth. The agent slipped down faster and faster, screaming until he was hoarse, screaming until his throat bled, screaming even as he passed well beyond the physical boundaries of that tangled web of pipes. Days later, when his skin started to shred off, it was almost welcome. SCP-015 Recovery Report Agent 2 MIA. Agent 6? MIA. Agent Lon? MIA. MRV 889236 status. Unrecovered. Data deemed non vital in light of lost staff. SCP 015 classified classification level review suggested. That's the end of SCP-015. Next, 016, Object Class Keter, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-015 is to remain within the confines of 5x5x5 five by five by five meter room at all times. Maintained at a temperature not to exceed 0 degrees Celsius. 
SCP-016 itself is to remain in the Petri dish in the containment cube at all times unless directed otherwise by level 4 or 05 personnel. Full documentation of experimentation with SCP-016 must be submitted before and after samples and duplicates of SCP-016 may be taken. Failure to follow these procedures will result in termination and reassignment as D-Class personnel. Only authorized personnel may be permitted to obtain samples and experiment with SCP-016 under BC-L5 containment conditions. If an outbreak does occur despite following the aforementioned procedures, directed base personnel are to implement a code signal lockdown and containment plan. Affected personnel are to be terminated on site by security forces wearing standard mission oriented protective posture, anti biological, and anti chemical equipment. Should the infection not be contained after 48 hours, the on site nuclear device is to be detonated. Remaining personnel are not to be evacuated under any circumstance. 016 has shown to survive up to 6 hours on hard surfaces, and up to several minutes in air. High intensity ultraviolet light and high concentrations of ortho... ...phthalahyde solution have been demonstrated to be effective in disinfecting non-organic surfaces. Description. 016 is a bloodborne pathogen recovered in a mine from a mine worker in blank who injured himself while working in a deep steam coal mine. Said wound became contaminated with coal dust from the mine, possibly infecting the worker with dormant spores. Over the next several days, 016 proceeded to infect the remaining employees of the mining camp as well as the CDC te crisis team dispatched to deal with the epidemic. Foundation personnel then took over the investigation and terminated all affected personnel. Patient Zero was brought into captivity, and the mine shaft was collapsed by an explosive device. Zero 016 has had an incubation period ranging from 24, to two, 24 hours to 2 years, depending on the presence and number of other human hosts in the area. First symptoms resemble a common cold, and include itchy eyes, runny nose, coughing, and body aches. Phase 2 begins in 48 hours, and consists of controlled form of hemorrhagic fever. Hemorrhagic. As the organism causes a small amount of blood to become aspirated in the lungs, creating an aerosol effect. During Phase 3, the host crashes and bleeds out bleeding profusely from every bodily orifice, including the nose, tear ducts, anus, skin pores, mouth, and urethra, and, in cases of females, vag vagina. Blood pressure skyrockets during the final stage. Hosts have been observed projectile vomiting blood to distances over 5 meters. Should the host survive this near-total in- exhaust- yeah. near-total exannuation, the pathogen will become dormant once more, returning to the incubation phase. What distinguishes 016 from other strains of hemorrhagic fever, such as Ebola and Marburg, is its unusual response to high stress. Should the subject undergo a high stress situation, such as a life threatening crisis, the organism will change its survival tactic to rapid, rapid reproduction to the rewriting of the host DNA and stimulation of the rapid cell division. Major psychological changes occur within the first 24 hours, with complete bodily reconstruction occurring in within two weeks' time. Most hosts do not survive the process due to heavy demands made on the body. An interesting side effect of the transformation is an increased aggressive urge. It is believed that this may be an attempt to maximize the spread of the virus in a manner similar to rabies. On another note, subjects who undergo bodily transformations no longer appear to exhibit 016's hemorrhagic properties. However, subjects infected by transformed hosts will still undergo the normal 016 infection process. Addendum. Experiment log of 016's transformative properties. Subject D. 
the class personnel infected by 016 upon showing, first showing symptoms, subjects' quarters were flooded, slowly flooded with water over a 24-hour period. 016 muted into tetramorphic state, allowing the subject's lungs, transforming the subject's lungs into gills. Subject survived for two more weeks as 016 transformed its limbs into fins, causing its eyes to slowly atrophy and enhanced its sense of hearing into a cetacean type echolocation ability. Subject was terminated by draining all water from its quarters, causing it to its physical sea. Body was subsequently cremated without autopsy. Subject B 16 2. B class personnel infected by 016. Upon showing, first showing symptoms, the subject's quarters were slowly flooded with water over a 24 hour period. 016 muted, mutated into tetramorphic state, causing the subject to undergo a massive ma yeah. causing the subject to undergo rapid muscular growth and increasing bone growth on knuckles. Subject attempted to escape from confinement by punching through the reinforced steel door. Subject was not successful and died drowning. Note, same situation, two different responses. Interesting. Dr. Blank. Subject D-16-3. D-class personnel infected by 016. Subject was previously a chemical engineer who poisoned his wife upon discovering her adultery. Upon sh first showing symptoms, subject's quarters were slowly flooded with water over a 24-hour period. 016 muted into a tetramorphic state, causing the subject to grow an unusual organ in his chest, consisting of a chamber and two separate tubes. Organ continued to take in water and swell in size until Foundation personnel, realizing what SCP-016 may be attempting, terminated the subject by gunshot. Organ was found to contain several gas sacs filled with acetylene gas and oxygen. Subject D-16-4 D-class personnel infected by SCP-16 Subject was told to concentrate on forming wings. No stress applied. SCP-016 did not mutate into a tetramorphic state. Subject died of exsanguation during Phase 3. Subject D-16-5 D-class subject infected by SCP-016. Subject was told to concentrate on forming wings and placed in a cryptic box suspended 305 1,000 feet meters above a mine shaft. A timer was placed outside the box, which the subject was told indicated the time of release. SCP-016 muted into a tetramorphic state, causing the subject to grow tentacle-like organs on his left wrist similar to a spider's spinneret. Subjects extended said organ through one of the box's air holes and extruded a long silk-like substance, which it then used to secure the box to the cable. Subject was terminated when the countdown reached zero and the bomb detonated. Footnotes. 1. Due to their similarities as fatal congestion contagions, that's... Yeah. Footnotes. 1. Due to their similarities as fatal contagions that stimulate the production of excess organs, a link, a possible link to SCP-1801 is under investigation. End of article. Next is SCP-017, Object Class Kettle. Special Containment Procedures. 017 is contained in an acrylic glass cage. 100 centimeters by 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, centrally suspended in a concrete room measuring 6 meters by 6 meters by 4 meters. Attached to the walls, ceiling, and floor of the room are high-intensity arc spot. Yeah. Attached to the walls, ceiling, and floor of the room are high-intensity arc lamp spotlights pointed directly at the acrylic cage to ensure that SCP-017 is constantly exposed to light from every angle. Personnel assigned to 017 control room are to monitor the functionality of the spotlights and the emergency generator system and call for maintenance immediately upon knowledge of a burnt out lamp or similar issue with the generator. The only circumstance under which personnel are allowed to entrance to replace is to replace the lamps. 
personnel entering the room are required to wear designated full body reflected suits and must be careful not to step in front of functioning spotlights. SCP-017 is a humanoid figure approximately 80 centimeters in height, anatomically similar to a small child, but with no disconcertable identifiable features. Identifying features. SCP-017 seems to be composed fully of a shadowy, smoke-like shroud. No attempt to find any object beneath the shroud has been successful, but the possibility has not been ruled out. SCP-017's reaction to shadows cast upon it is immediate and swift. 017 leaps at the object, casting the shadow, and completely encloses it in its shroud, whereupon it returns to its normal size, leaving no trace of the object behind. Additional notes. Personnel with beta clearance or higher should also see document 017-1. End 017. SCP-018 Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-018 is to be contained in a specialty metal restraint inside of a 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter sealed box lined with heavy synthetic padding. The sealed box is then submerged in the center of a of the 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter polyethylene holding tank. If SCP-018 is to break free from the holding box, the polyethylene-based goo will slow down the kinetic activity enough for proper retrieval by containment personnel. Personnel entering SCP-018's holding chamber are to wear specialized plating found inside of SCP-018 observation and a breathing apparatus before being lowered into the polyethylene tank. If SCP-018 is loose outside the polyethylene tank, personnel are advised to secure them themselves in a separate room and close doorways and or hatches to isolate SCP-018 until containment teams arrive. Description. SCP-018 has the appearance of a small ball, or of a super ball, sorry, made by the Wham-O company in 1969. It is 6 centimeters in diameter and colored red. Found when the Blank Company was hired to clean out a warehouse that had Wham-O merchandise in it, SCP-018 was noted to be able to bounce with extreme height. At first, it thought to be a pleasant child's toy, SCP-018 was able to bounce over 200% efficiency. That is, if dropped 1 meter, it will bounce 2, then 4, then 8, then 16 meters. The ball soon became a dangerous projectile, reaching speeds estimated over 100 kilometers an hour, and damaging property and injuring 5 of the city of blank. It came to arrest after several days in nearby Lake of Blank and was retrieved by the SCP personnel. Due to the speed of the object and the total surprise of its victims, no cover-up story was required or initiated. Document 18-04 Message to 05-blank Blank I hope everything is well. The reason I write to you is because I believe I have found a more effective method of retrieving new or escaped SCPs. Yes, I realize we haven't had any progress in reverse engineering whatever allows this thing to defy the laws of thermodynamics, but we have come up with a very effective method for integrating one of the those new SCP-A5 armor suits with this. Just hear me. Just hear me out. We implant it in the bottom of the boot, rig it up a little bit of a mechanical device, and ta-da! The suit is now capable of jumping well over a building. Also, if the wearer has their foot against something they want dead, let's say it delivers a hell of a kick. And I, all I need is permission to modify one of the pre-existing SCP-A5 suits, and you'll be able to actually capture blank, plus any other escaped SCP objects. Trust me, what if I let you down in the past? Dr. Blank. Documentation 018-6 letter to Dr. Blank. Dr. Blank. Upon assignment, Agent Blank was issued your modified 
SCP A5 armor in retrieving SCP blank, and the results were mixed. Agent Blank was able to place the blank collar onto SCP blank, chase it throughout the Amazon, and restrain it by dismemberment. However, due to a malfunction in your little mechanical device, he was launched almost a mile into the air and suffered two broken legs, several broken ribs, and a missing arm, and a skull fracture upon hitting the water of Lake Blank on the way back down. You will fix that before I, I author authorize your armor for common use. Document 18-11. Message to O5 blank. Blank. Don't worry, it's fixed. But I have some more ideas. If you grant me the use of some water from SCP-006, SCP blank, and possibly SCP blank, I can deliver you a set of SCP-A5 armor and an agent that can capture any, if not all, rogue, unattained SCPs. All I'm waiting for is your approval. SCP-006, I believe, was the water of life that we went over the last time. End of SCP-018. Now, SCP-019. Object Class Keter. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-019 is to be kept in a wide grate in a 3 meter by 3 meter by 4 meter reinforced concrete room, installed with an incinerator. The room is to be kept at 0 degrees Celsius when incinerator is not activated. An observation chamber separated by a plate glass window is to be used for constant observation of SCP-019. And if slash when specimens of 019-2 are observed, the incinerator is deactivated. In the event of an outbreak of SCP-019-2, ordinary firearms are successful in terminating individual specimens, although in the case of a swarm level outbreak, flamethrowers are more effective. SCP-019 should be kept in a vertical position at all times. Description. SCP-019 appears to be a very large ceramic vase, 1.8 meters in diameter at the mouth and 2.4 meters high. Style and decoration indicate it was created in classic Greece. Although conclusive dating is impossible, as the surface is entirely unbreakable by any known means. If a successful method is discovered, SCP-019 is to be destroyed with prejudice. Periodically, entities emerge from SCP-019, collectively they are known as SCP-019-2. These entities vary in many, many aspects, but tend to be small, vaguely humanoid, though they may have animaloid features and extremely hostile. They often choose to attack with teeth or claws, although fairly delicate, also surprisingly flammable, uh, they are reasonably strong and pose a considerable threat in large numbers. When kept at 0 degrees Celsius and totally at rest, entities will emerge from SCP-019 at a rate of approximately one entity per hour. Following traits are known to affect SCP-019-2's manifestation rate. Movement of SCP-019. Threat to SCP-019. Extreme temperature, high or lows. Sudden shift in surrounding environment. Introduction of objects or organisms to the inside of SCP-019, known to close float reactions, traits that may or may not influence SCP-019-2's manifestation rate, the presence of human life near SCP-019, current weather patterns, specific individuals near SCP-019, some individuals seem to affect SCP-019-2's emergence rate more drastically than others. In addition, Tipping or tilting SCP-019 will create a reaction as though it was previously filled with SCP-019-2 specimens, although viewers looking into SCP-019 from above will merely observe a dark hole. Due to the production rate of SCP-019 when the object is disturbed, measurement of the internal cavity is difficult, but it is suspected to be inconsistent with outside measurements. Addendum. Document SCP-019-2-A. scp 19-2 notes as maintained by Dr. Light and Dr. Box. Date. Blank, blank, blank. SCP-019-2 specimens were removed from containment chamber and kept in a reinforced pen, provided with water and live chickens as food. Specimens made quiet, continuous, garbled vocalizations determined to be phonetically similar to ancient Hellenic languages. Although the reason for this is unknown, specimens were thought to be no more intelligent than 
the specimens lived for less than 48 hours, and a dissection re revealed autonomy consistent on a cellular level with normal biology, but with an extremely unstable muscular skeletal architecture. A oh, muscular. I don't know why my, my, my brain went mollusk. Uh, muscular skeletal architecture. Other notable anomalies include an unstable respiratory system, nearly non-existent digestive tract, and virtually no other internal organs. All other captured specimens have followed similar patterns of behavior and demise. Note, it appears that SCP-019-2 specimens were not intended to live for meaningful amounts of time outside of 019. Dr. Vox. Date unknown. Containment unit was slightly damaged following prolonged exposure to SCP-019-2 specimen, missed by the monitoring team because of partial transparency. This has not been noted in SCP-019-2 before. Monitoring teams will continue to report further anomalies. Date redacted. Monitoring teams report that some specimens of SCP-019-2 now appear to be significantly more resistant to incineration than others. It is hypothesized that this is a defense mechanism on the part of SCP-019. Date redacted. Most specimens of SCP-019-2 are now all but entirely resistant to effects of the incinerator. Replacement of incineration incinerator with acid bath is now being considered. Evolution of SCP-019-2 is being studied and may be evidence of sentience in SCP-019. End of SCP-019. Next. SCP-020. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. Samples of SCP-20 are stored in a series of sealed cultivation chambers inside a sealed containment room at Biological Research Area 12, which is accessible only via airlock. Nutrients are administered via automated robotic systems, as the cultivation chamber must be remain sealed at all times. Medically sealed video surveillance systems are installed within the containment room, and must be checked daily for integrity. Any personnel entering the containment room must wear biological safe, biosafety level 5 equipment, including rebreathers, and undergo full antifungal disinfection upon exiting. Description SCP-020 is a fast-spreading fungal organism that is capable of affecting the senses and behavior of living creatures, including humans. Samples of 020 exhibit an unknown effect that renders them effectively invisible to direct observation, even while under a microscope. 020 is only visible to humans when viewed through photographic or video surveillance. Once 020 forms a colony, usually within a human residence, it will produce spores that affect the human behavior or affect the behavior of humans around it. Affected subjects will increase the heat and humidity of their homes to create an environment more suitable to the growth of SCP-020. Affected subjects will become more sociable in many cases, and often invite acquaintances into their homes to further spread the organism. As the spores of mold colonies are invisible to affected subjects, the mold may sometimes grow directly on living subjects. As the spores in colonies within a home approach critical condition, the health of affected human subjects will rapidly deteriorate, resulting in death. Further spread of mold may, may occur as the bodies of any deceased subjects are encouraged are encountered by emergency responders and healthcare agents, as well as transmission of the bodies to local morgues. SCP-020 was first encountered in Redacted where an undercover SCP agent noted dramatic personality changes in personnel working at the local hospital. On investigation by a containment team, it was discovered that almost hundreds of civilians had been infected, as well as the majority of the town. The civilian population was terminated and the town incinerated under cover of a local flash forest fire. To date, over 12 outbreaks of SCP-020 have been reported. Investigations are currently underway to determine the sources of these outbreaks and possible preventative measures. Addendum 020-1 Excerpts from the audio-video mission recorders of Mobile Task Force Eta-10, See No Evil, during the initial containment of SCP-020 on Redacted. T2 Lead Team 2, moving to the Red House. T2 Calm. Copy. UAV-1 is picking up one heat signature. T2 lead. 
Team 2 in place. Ready to br Expletive. T2-2. Door opening. At this time, a civilian woman appeared in the doorway holding a kitchen knife. Video surveillance shows that it nearly two-thirds of her face is covered by growth mold growths. Civilian woman. Well, hello there, gentlemen. Here to take a breather inside? T2 lead. On the ground. Drop a weapon. Civilian woman. Don't be silly. Come on in and stay a bit hot. E2 lead. Stop where you are. Drop the weapon. Civilian woman. We, we just want to have some guests. Please, come in. T2. Drop the expletive. Weapon. It is assumed that at this point the infected civilian noticed T2-4 carrying a prime incendiary weapon and lunged at the team member with a knife. Civilian woman. Data expunged. T2 lead. Open fire. Open fire. Gunfire. Screaming. End of SCP-20. I'm now going to go grab a glass of water, and I will be right back with SCP-21. Okay, and I'm back. <laughs> SCP-021 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-021 is an obligate parasite of the human body. Containment, therefore, is no more difficult than allowing the... or than containing an adult human, most cells will suffice. Object is currently housed in detention cell 217A on subject D-139. Only D-class personnel are eligible for hosting SCP-021 as long as a given subject survives as a host for SCP-021, he is exempted from the normal monthly terminations of D-class personnel. Description: SCP-021 takes the form of a large elaborate tattoo of a serpentine dragon in the oriental style, covering approximately 0 0.8 square meters of the skin. This tattoo is fully animate within the confines of its host skin and behaves largely as a normal animal would, albeit in only two dimensions. The tattoo's movement causes constant pain to its host, comparable and similar to, in character to simultaneous tattooing and tattooing removal on a large scale. The organism tends to spend most of its time on or near the torso. SCP-021 displays no intelligence beyond a basic pattern of feeding and locomotion, although, it occasionally, although occasionally measuring the intelligence of a two-dimensional life form uh, has proven impossible thus far. Actually measuring it, sorry. SCP-021 appears to feed exclusively on pigments in the human skin. This can include melatonin, in which case the subject appears to be suffering from uh, vitiligo. Vitiligo? Vitiligo. However, the organism shows a marked preference for other tattoos and will seek out and devour these before resorting to normal natural pigments. It should be noted that the feeding process itself, beyond the sensation of movement, is painless. Normal tattooing simply vanishes as it is eaten. The organism, no, the organism maintains its a constant size, and no excretions have been observed. The organism is capable of clearing over 0.6 square meters of skin per hour. 
One may feed SCP-21 by quickly tattooing fruits or small animals on the host. SCP-021 can be transferred between hosts by various forms of physical contact with differing rates of success. In most cases of successful transfer, the organism simply swims from one person to another. Sexual intercourse appears to be the most reliable method of transfer with a 93% transmission rate. However, due to the severe pain involved, it is less than ideal. Contact between two, wound two open wounds is generally preferable. Transfer is more complicated in deceased subjects, though not unreasonably so. The organism suffers no ill effects from the death of its host and continues to consume pigments. Transmissions between species is unknown. Previous tests suggest it is entirely impossible or exceedingly rare. SCP-021 does not confer some benefit to its host. The tattoo has been proven, or does confer some benefit to its host. The tattoo is proven to accelerate the release and reuptake of endorphin and decrease lactic acid buildup, providing boosts of strength, confidence, and pain tolerance in stressful situations, and reduce the usual after effects from weakness and fatigue. In addition, the tattoo seems to have some beneficial effects on the host's immune system. Aggression profiles in hosts are generally higher than average, though whether this is a direct effect of the tattoo or simply a reaction to the constant pain remains to be seen. The symbiotic relationship is usually limited by how long the host can tolerate such pain in everyday life. This has accumulated in suicide in a number of subjects. In rare cases, hosts have also fallen victim to fatal skin infections. SCP-021's origins and nature are a mystery. Tracing its, its transmissions from host to host is hardly feasible within the confines of secrecy, and the organism should could well be hundreds of years old, if not more. Nevertheless, SCP-021's captivity is one of the longest in the Foundation's history at nearly data expunged years, and has been very educational thus far. Current research focuses mainly on observing the characteristics of life in two dimensions. And that's where we're going to end off today. Thank you, anyone who has come for coming. Tell me if the audio is any better. I was trying out a new setting on the mic. And uh, if you like, leave a like. If you really liked it, leave a subscription if you're on YouTube or I don't think anyone's here on Twitch, but follow on Twitch is always appreciated. Uh, I'm going to head off for now, see if I can get some more sleep. And in the meantime, have a wonderful day out there. Au revoir.